everyone? Man, with that epic music, one of the, I feel like I need to ride out on a white stallion one of these times, uh, you know, or have somebody deliver my notes in like a, I don't know, a jester's outfit. I don't know. But anyway, hey, we're glad you guys are here. We are really glad you're here at this time. Uh, matter of fact, uh, for those of you... Uh, it's right now 10 a.m., which means to some people it's 9 a.m. So in about 30 to 45 minutes, since this is the crossing, uh, people will start walking in here thinking church is about to start. So just don't laugh at them. Don't look at them, point at them. But anyway, congratulations. You all made it. Hey, uh, you probably recognized uh, the music to uh, The Crown. Uh, if you are someone who has ever watched The Crown on Netflix, let me see your hands. All right. Eight or nine of you. Great. Great. We are the intellectuals of the bunch. No, seriously. How many tried the crown, one episode of the crown, and then gave up? Let me see the hands. Yeah. Here's the thing. Let me just tell you. For those of you who tried one episode and said, mm, not for me. Um, it's about the queen, okay? Episode one, she's not even the queen yet. So stick with it, all right? The, the whole series is about the queen, but it's an incredible series. But here's the thing. The good news is... If you've never watched The Crown, you have no intention of ever watching The Crown, the great thing is this series has nothing to do with the Netflix uh, show The Crown. So you can relax, all right? But we are going to talk about another crown. We are going to talk about the royal family of David and the life of David. But let me just say, I was someone who whenever the royal family would come on the Today Show or something like that, I would always switch the channel. I never wanted to hear who cared. I didn't want to know what was going on with the royal family. I did not want to know the latest gossip, and so I would flip the channel. But the crown changed that for me. Not that I'm always trying to figure out what's going on, but the one thing is, it, it changed my, um, my appreciation, let me just say, for the queen. Uh, and it's interesting because the show, The Crown, is actually about the queen who's still alive, at least the last I checked. And so it's really interesting to follow this show. But one of the things that I, I really have come to appreciate is there, there's a lot of power and, and prestige that comes with that position, but yet it doesn't really have a lot of uh, authority in making a lot of the decisions right now. But one of the things that, that uh, it does a really good job portraying is what William Shakespeare said, and that is, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. See, when Elizabeth's father, King George VI, died, she was out of the country because he was too sick to go to Kenya. So she went out on this uh, kind of uh, goodwill thing, uh, mission trip to Kenya. And basically she's up in the treetops uh, with the elephants and that when uh, word gets back that her father has died. So basically in, in one breath, in one moment, in one instant, she went from being a princess to the queen. And so I find that very fascinating. There's actually a scene where it just kind of demonstrates the steep learning uh, curve because uh, her, her father's grandmother, Queen Mary, um, she asked her this question. She says, now you wrote a letter to me and you said loyalty to the idea you have inherited is the duty above everything else because the calling comes from the highest source. It comes from God himself. And she says, do you, do you believe that? And this is what the grandmother, Queen Mary's response was to that question. Watch this. Monarchy is a calling from God. That is why you're crowned in an abbey, not a government building. Why you're anointed, not appointed. It's an archbishop that puts the crown on your head, not a minister or public servant. Which means that you are answerable to God in your duty, not the public. I'm not sure that my husband would agree with that. He would argue that in any equitable modern society that church and state should be separated. That if God has servants, they're priests, not kings. He would also say that he watched his own family destroyed because they were seen by the people to embody indefensible and unreasonable ideas. Yes, but he represents a royal family of carpetbaggers and parvenus that goes back, what, 90 years? What would he know of Alfred the Great, the rod of equity and mercy, Edward the Confessor, William the Conqueror, Henry the Eighth? It's the Church of England, dear, not the Church of Denmark or Greece. Next question. The comment that jumped out to me is that monarchy is a calling from God. That's why when you're crowned, you're crowned in an abbey, not some government building. And she said, you are anointed, not appointed. 
Well, today we're going to start a six-week series about someone else who was anointed by God, and that is the life of David. And, and he is a king that there is a lot of things we can learn from him. Today we're going to talk about kind of his anointing, the call of David. But then we're going to talk about the courage. We're going to talk about times when he had to make some decisions. We're going to talk about his conscience and how he dealt with some decisions. We're going to talk about his compromise. And many of us, you know, if you know anything about David, you know a lot about his compromise. But then we're going to talk about how he dealt with that compromise when he was confronted. And then finally, we're going to wrap it all up by talking about his character. But like I said, today, I, I want to talk about the call, the very beginning, the anointing, the first time we actually come to see David. And if you have your Bibles with you, and I don't know, we may want to bring the house lights up a little bit more so you can read them, but the Bibles are there in front, or you can get out your Version app or your Bible app. Uh, if you have your Bibles in front of you, on a page, you can find it on page 247 in the uh, Bible there in the chairs in front of you. But the thing is, is I, I really want to read from 1 Samuel chapter 16. And we're going to kind of spend a lot of time on that passage here today. So turn with me to 1 Cham uh, Samuel chapter 16. We're going to read verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, how long are you going to mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem because I have selected a king from his sons. Samuel asked, well, how can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord answered, take a young cow with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will let you know what you are to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate to you. And Samuel did what the Lord directed and went to Bethlehem. And when the elders of the town met him, they trembled and asked, do you come in peace? In peace, he replied, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and said, certainly the Lord's anointed one is here before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his stature because I have rejected him. Humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. Jesse called Abinadab and presented him to Samuel. The Lord hasn't chosen this one either, Samuel said. And then Jesse presented Shema, but Samuel said, the Lord hasn't chosen this one either. And after Jesse presented seven of his sons to him, Samuel told Jesse, the Lord hasn't chosen any of these. And then Samuel asked him, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, he said, but right now he's tending the sheep. Samuel told Jesse, send for him. We won't sit down to eat until he gets here. So Jesse sent for him. He had a beautiful eyes and a healthy, handsome appearance. And then the Lord said, anoint him, for he is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David from this day forward. Now there's a lot of things that you can take away from just the very beginning when it comes to the life of David. But what does it mean? What does it mean then and what does it mean to us right now? Well, the first thing I want to kind of just look at is right at the very beginning, he's kind of told to get over Saul. I just want you to get over him. Now, why is that? Why would God say, I want you to get over Saul? He says, basically, how long are you going to mourn for him since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Now, for one, you have to understand that Samuel was a prophet of God. He was considered one of the last judges. Samuel basically came by way of birth of a mother who did not think she could have children, a mother named Hannah, who then decided because God gave her uh, Samuel, she was going to give him back to God. And so he was raised by Eli, a high priest, who basically was had a very corrupt family, a brother or sons, and it just it was bad, bad, bad. And so basically what ended up happening is God said, I'm not going to go through your line anymore, Eli. I'm going to go, and Samuel's going to be my guy. Samuel's going to be the prophet. And so that's what's going on here. And, and the thing is, is Samuel then became the voice of God. And there were many times he would say to the Israelites, you need to get rid of the foreign gods and you need to worship the one true God. Because they were having all kinds of problems. The Philistines stole the ark. They ended up giving it back because they were sick the whole time they had it. But there was all kinds of things going on. 
And so Samuel is basically telling them, you need to get back to the one God. Get rid of all these gods, all these idols. And that's the kind of message. Well, when it finally gets sunk through to them, one of the things that the people of Israel said is, okay, we get it. We get that he is the one true God. But here's the deal. We can't see him. I mean, maybe you have a good relationship with him. We can't see him. He's like he's invisible to us. We want a king. We, we want what all these other countries have. We want what all these other empires have. They have somebody they can bow to. They have a, they have a king. So, so while we know he is our God, we want a king. And basically, God says to Samuel, and Samuel's disappointed, and God basically tells Samuel, you know what, look, they're, they're, this isn't about you. This is really about me. This is about me. So it's okay. Go and anoint them a king. And so Samuel anoints Saul. And apparently he's a great choice because he looks real kingly-like, which I don't know what that is. But 1 Samuel 10, 23, it says, They ran and got him from there, and when he, this is Saul, stood among the people, he stood a head taller than anyone else. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the one the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among the entire population. And all the people, they seemed to like it because they said, Long live the king. And so Samuel played a big role in anointing, choosing Saul. And Saul starts out really good. I mean, he's, he's winning battles. He seems to be making good decisions. But the thing about Saul is he can be a little bit temperamental. He can be a little moody. He can be a little hot-headed. And like a lot of kings, he was pretty insecure. And not only that, he had a problem with actually doing the things that God asked him to do. He had this problem with obedience. And, and, and God would, again, speak to Saul through his man, through Samuel. Let me give you an example. One time God told King Saul through Samuel this in 1 Samuel 15. So if you want to flip back a page, it says this. Samuel told Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you as king over the people of Israel. Now listen to the words of the Lord. This is what the Lord of the armies says. I witnessed what the Amalekites did to the Israelites when they opposed them along the way as they were coming out of Egypt. Now go and attack the Amalekites and completely destroy everything they have and do not spare them. Kill men and women, infants and nursing babies oxen and sheep, camels and donkeys. And then verse 7, then Saul struck down the Amalekites. He captured King Agag. He captured him alive. But he completely destroyed all the rest of the people with the sword. Saul and the troops spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the goats, the cattle and choice animals as well as the young rams and the best of everything else. They were not willing to destroy them, but they did destroy all the worthless and unwanted things. And so Saul sees Samuel coming, and I love this little exchange, and this is kind of the way I see things. But this little exchange, so when, when Samuel comes to Saul, Saul says to them, may the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. I have done everything that the Lord has asked me to do. And Samuel replies, then what is the sound of sheep, goats, and cattle I hear? Let me put it in the way I see it. Hey, Samuel, I've done it. I did everything that the Lord has asked of us. And Samuel's like, are you kidding? What part of destroy everything do you not understand? Why am I hearing a moo-moo here and a bye-bye there, here a moo, there a moo, everywhere? You're bad. Bad, bad, bad Saul. You know, that's kind of the way I see it going down. I'm sure it probably didn't go like that. But Saul answered, the truth brought them from the Malachites and spared the best sheep, goats, and cattle. And here's the reason we did it, Lord. We had a good reason. I mean, I know you told us, God. We know you told us what to do. But we had a good reason for why we chose to go our way and do what we did. Because here's the reason. We're going to keep the best so we can offer it as a sacrifice to you. But the rest of the stuff, the stuff that didn't mean anything, the stuff that nobody would want, well, that went to the yard sale, you know. That went to Goodwill. No, that, that, we slaughtered that stuff. 
But the best of everything, we kept it. And, and we did it. We did it so we could sacrifice it to the Lord. And Sam says, stop. Just stop. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And of course, Saul leans in. Tell me. What is the word the Lord has for me? And Samuel said this, to obey God is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and defiance is like wickedness and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has now rejected you as a king. And, and here's, here's something we have to take away from that. There are a lot of times we go through a lot of rituals and we do a lot of things in the name of the Lord. There are a lot of things that we do under the umbrella of the Lord. But we do it being completely disobedient of him along the way. And what he would say is, I want your obedience. If you're going to worship me with those lips, then I want you worshiping me the other six days of the week as well. Otherwise, I don't want it. Because it's disobedience. It's like divination. It's like it's wicked. And so that's the lesson we could take away just from that statement alone. Is don't be worshiping other gods and idols all along the week and then come and throw out your best one day a week. Because I don't want that. I don't want it. So, so here's a little bit of the history. Is why Samuel was being told to get over Saul. Because first of all, Samuel and Saul, while they didn't always see eye to eye, Samuel chose him. He picked him out. He had a relationship with this guy. And not only did he have a relationship with this guy, but he's the one that has to tell him, I just want you to know, you may be the king in the eyes of the people, but you are no longer the king in the eyes of God because he's picked somebody else. And so he just got done delivering that message. So no matter how mad he was at Saul, you know that had to sting. You know that had to bother him. You know that's something that bothers him. So, so you can understand why Samuel is discouraged. And so you can understand why God said, I want you to get over that. Move on. I want you to fill your horn, and, er, your horn with oil and go because I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem because I have selected a king from his sons. And so Samuel did what the Lord directed and went to Bethlehem. But when the elders or the, the, the elderly, the, the, the leaders of that community, maybe the commissioners, the town council, the, the leaders of that community, when the elders of the town met him, when they saw Samuel come and pull in a heifer, they trembled. And asked, do you come in peace? Now, why would they ask that question? Do, do, do you come in peace? Well, there's a couple good reasons. First of all, because Samuel was known as a man of God, as a prophet, as one who spoke on behalf of the Lord. And, and, and Bethlehem was kind of like that one traffic-like kind of town. You know, it's like, what, what, what are you doing here? I mean, nobody comes here of your stature Unless they are lost or they're filling up for gas and heading somewhere else. So what are you doing here? And so they're a little nervous that, that why are you, a man of God, coming to Bethlehem? Imagine how nervous they would be knowing that centuries later someone else is going to be visiting that very same town by way of a manger. You know? I mean, if Samuel makes them nervous, can you imagine what they'd have thought if they knew that God was going to join us in flesh through that little sleepy town of Bethlehem? So the first reason is, they're, they're amazed. I mean, what are you doing here? What, that, we're a little nervous. But here's the other reason I think they were trembling. Because news gets around fast, but bad news or dramatic news or tragic news gets around even faster. And here's the thing. Is remember how Saul disobeyed God because God said, I want you to destroy everything? Remember that? Well, Samuel was a man of God. So since Saul wasn't going to do it, I'll do it. And so what we see in verses 20, or 32 through 33, and let me just warn you, what I'm about to read will not make the top 100 list of memory verses that you should memorize. This is not a memory verse you have learned in church camp, VBS, or Sunday school, boys and girls. But let me tell you, this is what happened. Samuel said, bring me King Agag. And Agag came to him trembling, for he thought certainly the bitterness of death has come. And Samuel declared, as your sword has made women childless, so your mother will be childless among women. Then he hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord. 
you're not going to find that on a coffee cup or a bumper sticker and have the passage on there. You know what I'm saying? I don't remember that one in Sunday school. But he had to do it because he was a man of God and he knew, hey, you know what? This is what God wants and if you're not going to do it, I'll do it. So imagine this guy's coming to town, leading a heifer into your sleepy little town and the reputation is he just chopped to pieces this, this king of the Malachites. So you can now imagine why they were a bit trembling, like, what, what are you doing here? Are, are you here in peace or are you going to cut us to pieces? You know, I mean, that's, what are you here for? And he says to them, no, I'm, I'm here for peace so you can relax. And then he gets Jesse and says, we're going to have a sacrifice. I want you to get consecrated. I want you to, to get cleaned up, so to speak. And I want you to clean up your sons as well. And then, this is amazing, all of a sudden Samuel like the judge in some reality show, we'll call him Samuel Cow, uh, decides to line up all of Jesse's sons to see which one is going to win the prize to be the next king that's going to be nice. So here, okay, get your sons all lined up, and let's line, let's line them up from the oldest to the youngest, all right? Let's do it. And then we're going to work through the left to right. And Samuel sees Eliab first, and he says, that's the winner. That is the one. I mean, sir, I mean, look at that. Look at him. He looks kingly. I mean, certainly, if, if there's going to be a king, it's going to be this one. And, and when he saw that, it's kind of amazing because even this man of God automatically defaulted back to the natural measuring stick we tend to go with. Because we tend to always judge things by first impressions, by appearances, by status, by rank, by stature, by wealth, and so on. We tend to do the very same thing. And so even this man of God had a moment where he kind of defaulted back and kind of forgot what God felt about the whole thing. Because we tend to always do that. We are always defaulted back. We have this strong pull to always see the outward potential in people. And we completely overlook what's in here. What's in the heart? And Samuel, of all people, should have known why God was moving on from Saul. He might have looked good, but his heart did not belong to me. So I'm finding me another king. And Samuel falls into what is typical of all of us. But what we see in the Lord's response is God doesn't look at the outside. He doesn't look at your rank, your status, your age, your portfolio, the number of awards you've received, that doesn't matter. Here's what he looks at. Don't look at his appearance or his stature because I've rejected him. Humans do not see what I see. For humans see what is visible, but I see what is in the heart. Now, I could go a whole different direction and preach a whole little message on that. We're going to kind of come back to that when we talk about the character because that, that, there's a lot that we can go there, all right? Because here's the thing, what that means is I don't care how good you look and how many good things you do, the reality is he still sees your heart. What would he see? What does he see? That should scare us. But we're not going to talk about that right now because that is too much. So back to Selection Sunday, right? Selection Sunday, get it? Selection Sunday. It's March Madness coming up. Anyway, um, Selection of Sun, S-O, okay, never mind. Um, so Samuel works his way back through the lineup of all seven sons. He comes to this one. It's like, nope, not it. Mm, nope, not it. Nope, 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 nope. Gets to all of them and it's like, I got nothing. Nothing. And I'm sure when he gets to the last one, he's like, nope. It had to be a bit awkward. Now you got these sons all lined up there. You have to hear crickets at this point. It's like, okay, what's, well, what are we going to do? And then... Samuel actually asks what I also think is a pretty awkward question. Is, hey guys, I'm sorry, it's none of you. But Jesse, I gotta ask, do you happen to have any other sons? Now in 2019, that sounds like a question for the Mari Povich show. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> it's like, okay, do you have any more sons? And then, you know, before we come back, the, you know, when we ask the question, and then as we're panning out the commercial, show Jesse, show the sons, show the wife, and then we're going to find out when we come back from commercial break whether he had other sons or not. That's kind of what it sounds like to me is a Maury Povich moment. But it is absolutely crazy 
that a prophet of God comes into Bethlehem in this sleepy little town and says, hey, I want you all to get consecrated because we are going to have a sacrifice and then we're going to have a consecration. We are going to choose a king. I find it very interesting that Jesse thought, I'll get all of these guys together but one. I'm going to leave one of them out in the field. One of them I don't think needs to come. And I find that unbelievable. And so Jesse says, well... Yeah, you know, as a matter of fact, there is the youngest, but he's out tending sheep, which tells you a lot about what he thinks of his youngest and a lot about what he thinks about the profession of shepherding. And it's important, the most important gathering the family would ever know, and David doesn't even get an invite. And Samuel says, well, you know what, go get him. Go get that guy. We will not sit down until he comes. And when when David comes in, the Lord says to Samuel, He impresses upon Samuel, and Samuel's listening now. He he almost didn't listen. He almost said, that's the guy, but he remembered. No, no, no. He told me to go anoint his son, and, and it's not about that. And so he remembers, and he takes the horn of oil, and he anoints him. The Jewish historian Josephus, it's kind of like our Doris Kearns of the day, he wasn't even a believer, but he was one who wrote about Jewish history. This is what he said. Samuel the aged whispered in his ear the meaning of the symbol of the anointing. And he whispered, you will be the next king. You're next. And this is a pivotal moment. Because we learn through the prophecies that through the line of David will come the Messiah. It is a crucial, critical moment. And David wasn't even invited. He wasn't even asked to line up. So, how does that story of David's call apply to us today? What what can we, what can you and I learn from that account? Well, a couple quick thoughts. And again, each one of these could be a sermon in itself. So I'm just going to kind of go through them quickly. But I think the first one is, we kind of get a preview of what God's grace looks like. What, what God's grace looks like to us. Because the first thing is, is David did nothing. He was out in the field. And yet God still chose him. He was still out there. He wasn't even at the initial party. He was out just tending sheep. He was just a lowly shepherd. And yet God chose him. And that is what grace looks like. It works the same way with you and me. You and I are not asked to do anything. We do absolutely nothing. We never deserve it. We will not earn it. We will never be able to acquire or achieve whatever is necessary to have a relationship with Jesus. Jesus has invited us even though we are out in the field. That is a picture of grace. And that is a picture of us. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, For you are chosen, that is another way of anointed, you are a chosen, anointed people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the field. He called you out of the darkness into the wonderful light. Once you had no identity as people, I mean, we didn't even invite you to the party. We didn't even think you'd be one of the ones that would make the lineup. But now you have been chosen. You are God's people. Once you received no mercy, and now you have received God's mercy. Ephesians 1, 5 and 7. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure to say, get out of the field and come in here because I have chosen you. I have laid down my son, Jesus Christ, so that you can be a part of my family. That is the message of grace. And that is the message that every single one of us need to hear. And every single one of us has received an invitation. And all you have to do to get out of that field of darkness is receive the invitation and come home and be anointed. That's all you have to do is the invitation is there. You just have to show up. 
Another lesson, and there's a small reference of this in the coming chapter, but you, you got to find it to see it. But, but David, here's an interesting thing about David. David. Even after David was anointed and said, you will be the next king, even after all that, he went back out to the field. He went back to the sheep. Matter of fact, 1 Samuel 16, 19, 20, Saul actually asked, send me your son David, who is with the sheep. He's in, he's in the field. David went back and did what he did before he was anointed. David didn't get anointed and say, hey, can I have that, that little horn and so I could bronze it and hang it in my tent because that is a special moment. He didn't say, you know what, since I'm going to be the next king, yeah, I kind of like that, that candy apple colored chariot there. I want one of those so I can ride it through town and say, I'm the next king. Bow to me, bow to me, bow to me. I'm the next king. No, he didn't do that. He said, I'm going back to the sheep. I'm going back to the field. And, and that, again, will, will just be a foreshadowing of the kind of heart that David had. It, was a, it showed humility. It showed he went back to the field without the fanfare. But it also shows us this, that just because God has called you, it doesn't always come with lightning bolts and fire and drastic change. Sometimes he's called you and you still go back in the field. Because the reality is, I think a lot of times when we say, I'll give my life to the Lord, and okay, we, we expect there to be a cloud by day and a fire by night and some sort of Red Sea dividing moment. And because that doesn't happen to us, we think, well, it must not have been real. It must not have took. And what we see here is that he was anointed. He was chosen by God, and yet he still went back out to the field. You know, I met so many people like, well, I just don't, I didn't feel different. I don't feel anything different. One of my favorite stories on baptism by Bob Russell is Bob Russell was a pastor of a pretty good-sized church down in Southeast in Louisville, uh, Southeast Christian in Louisville. And uh, he, he told this story about he was getting ready to baptize someone. He, he, this lady is down in the baptistry in front of thousands of people. And it's kind of a, a moment, and it's during that moment she says, she asked this question, what will it feel like? When it happens. And, and he's like, huh? She's like, when, when I receive the Holy Spirit, what does it feel like? And he's like, well, um, again, standing in the baptistry with all these people, you know, that is something that we just have to take on faith. We have to believe that if God says that's going to happen, that's going to happen. And she seems to be okay with that answer. And so he baptizes her. He lays her down. But as he's laying her down, her eyes come wide open under the water. And when he brings her up, she's like, wah! And he's like, oh, my gosh. What, why, God? I mean, I didn't feel that. I mean, why did she? What happened? And so he asks her, he's like, why the response? What happened? She goes, he goes did, what did it feel like? She goes, I don't know. But when you laid me down, you banged my head against those steps. And so it hurt. I honestly think that some of us believe that when you've been chosen by God, there's this Wah! moment. And it doesn't always happen that way. He got anointed, he got chosen, and he went back to the sheep. And there's a reason for that. Because God can do a lot of work in the field. He can do a lot of preparation work. You know, we always think that because we don't see God moving, we think he's not moving. Well, he's always moving. He's always moving. I talk about it all the time. It's, it's, it's God working upstream out of sight. There are things that happen to you in a moment that you, you realize when it hits you that, you know what, this took decades to get to here. But it didn't mean God wasn't moving. He's always moving. And David went back to the field. And the reason he went back to the field, I believe, is because in the field there's solitude. And there's obscurity, and there's monotony. And I'll tell you, I've, I, I've done a job where it was very monotony. And the great thing about monotony is it gives you a lot of time to think. When you're just doing the same thing, it gives you a lot of time to think. And what do you think you're thinking about when you have that solitude? Whose voice do you actually get to hear? And I believe that it was there he learned to hone his skill of listening to the voice and hearing the voice of God. Because when he comes down out of those hills and he becomes a king, he's going to hear a lot of voices. But is he going to recognize the voice of his God? And I believe it was a time of distraction free. As a matter of fact, it was probably while he was out in the fields that he may have had a thought or two about God and jotted it down. And it said something like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And it is the most 
often quoted passage of scripture on television and movies at funerals at whatever. We all know that one. Well, I don't think he came up with that sitting on the throne in the busy, hectic traffic of Jerusalem. That came to him when he went back out in the field. And God can do big things through you even when it seems like you've been put back out in the pasture. And I think that's an important lesson. Here's another lesson. When God calls you or anoints you, your family and your friends, your little circle of influence is probably going to be the last ones to see it in you. They're going to be the last ones to stand up and say, here comes the king. Here comes the queen. I always, no, they're going to probably be some of your greatest critics. They're the ones that are going to not notice it. They're not going to recognize it. They're not going to believe it. I mean, let's be honest. Have you ever tried to diet when the rest of your family isn't dieting? It doesn't work really well, does it? It's like, okay, you go ahead and diet while I'm eating my graders. Go ahead. That's fine. Well, if that's the way people, if, if you think trying to diet or trying to give something up for Lent is hard when nobody else has given that up, well, imagine what it's like to say, I'm going to pursue a life of God. He's going to be my God. I imagine not everybody's going to jump on the bandwagon and recognize that that was a good move on your part. They'll be the last to see it. They'll be the last to appreciate it. As a matter of fact, some will be quite resistant to the idea. Jesus even said in Luke that a prophet is not welcome in his own town. Now, Hud and I talk about that all the time. We're from Bethel. The reason it's hard for us to do ministry here is because people know what we did when we were in high school and middle school. You know, my, it's like, my, you know, we have rel- I have relatives that, that attend this church, including my mom. I'm not going to point her out, but she's down front. And, and you know, <laughs> there are things that I say up here. She's like, uh-huh, hmm, 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 hmm. I grounded you over that one time if you want to remember. But the point is, is it, it's hard to be chosen by God around your circle of influence. Because quite honestly, most of them probably thought you were probably the one that should have been out in the field. There are so many others that would have been so much better for this role. I wouldn't have seen it in you. And let's be honest. There are some of you where you know God is calling you out of the field. You know it. You've heard it. You're sensing it. But you know what you're doing? You're more comfortable out there. Because you can't imagine that he would actually call you in so he can anoint you. You can't even imagine that you would be the one he would choose out of a lineup. And so Satan whispers in your ear, he's like, he ain't going to use you. He's not going to use you. You screwed up too much. Just stay out here in the field where it's comfortable. Just let that party happen without you. And we hear that all the time. And so some of you, you need to, you need to, you need to say, shut up, Satan. And come in out of the field so that he can anoint you, choose you, so you can be a part of the royal family. And that leads to the last point. God can use anyone, even you, and even me. God loves to color outside the lines of what we expect. Isaiah 55, he says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. My ways are nothing like your ways. So if you're sitting there thinking, I just don't see how I fit into his plan. Well, That's because you're you and you're not him. And his thoughts of his plans for you and the ways he sees using you isn't going to be the way you see it and the way you sense it. Because his ways are not like our ways and his thoughts are not like, they're much higher than our ways and our thoughts. And God regularly chose people that everybody else overlooked. He went with the underdogs. He went with those who were like, are you kidding? That lady? You're going to use that lady? Everybody in town knows that lady. Why would you use her? Because my ways and my thoughts are not like your thoughts and not like your ways. God chooses the unlikely to do great things. And there's a reason for that. Because when God chooses the unlikely people to do great things, then God's going to be the one that gets the glory for that. And the credit for that, because everybody's like, no way, there's no way. That had to be a miracle. That was God right there. That was God. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is the one many of you maybe have heard it through other versions, you know, about how God uses the foolish to, uh, to shame the wise and the weak to shame the strong. But I love how Eugene uh, Peterson's paraphrase says it. He says this, take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you. Not many influential Not many from high society families. 
isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses? Chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right thinking and right living, a clean slate and a fresh start comes from God by the way of Christ Jesus. That's why we have this saying going around here that if you're going to blow your horn, pick up and blow the trumpet for God. Because what happens to me, what happens to you, it's not me, it's not you, it's not our ability. It's because of the grace of God. And God wants to adopt you into his royal family. Like I said earlier, on the day that Elizabeth's father died, it was famously written in a guest book where she was staying in Kenya. A gentleman wrote, for the first time in history, a young girl climbed up a tree as a princess, and when she came down, she was a queen. See, life changed in an instant. She became royalty. When Samuel came to Bethlehem, it could be written, for the first time in history, a young boy came out of the field a shepherd and returned to that field a king. In an instant, he had a chance to be royalty. And here's the good news for you. Galatians 4, when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, in Bethlehem, subject to the law. And God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. That could be said is our anointing, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. And now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. And that means, because of what Jesus Christ did for you and me, to buy us freedom from the slavery and the bondage of sin, for the first time possibly in your story today, you can walk in here from out of the dark as a sinner and because of Jesus leave as a child of the king. And in a moment, in an instant, yes, you, you can become royalty. Royalty. And so I'm going to ask you right now to pray with me. And if you are someone that's out in the field, you need to get your butt out of the field and in the presence of God because he wants you. He demonstrated his love for you by giving his son, Jesus Christ, for you so that you could be a part of this family, be a part of his family, so that you could be adopted into his royal family. And I don't know what's keeping you from making that decision. You probably do. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's shame. Maybe it's that you still can't wrap your mind around that he would actually use you. But I'm going to tell you, stop listening to that voice. Because the voice that we listen to is stuff about outward appearance. God, God looks at the inside. And God can do anything with you. And... For the rest of us who maybe have made that decision, I'd kind of go back to what Samuel said earlier to Saul, and that is obedience, it's better than sacrifice. Don't go through the motions. Be obedient. Follow him. And here's the great thing, and we'll talk more about this later on is if you think, oh, I can't do it, I can't, I, I try, I try, I try, I try to be obedient, I just can't do it. Well, that's the great news about Jesus. He came, he did what he did, so that we could be obedient. In the eyes of God, it's because of Christ we can find and be obedient in his eyes. So, I guess you see the common denominator there? It's all about Jesus. So I'm going to pray, and then if you would like prayer... If you want to talk about baptism, we have some baptisms going on here this morning. So the water, I don't know if it's warm or not, but it's there. And so uh, we have stuff that we can take care of it if you're not prepared. Um, 
but I'm going to pray, and then we're just going to kind of continue with worship. God, I pray right now um, for each and every heart in this room that you will speak to each and every one of us, and that we will hear it, we will listen, and we will respond. And God, the, uh, there are so many voices out there that will do everything they can to distract us, to convince us that we are not an option for you, that you would not want us. But God, you've shown us how much you want us, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, into this world. He left heaven to take on the form of a servant. And the greatest form of that servant is showing how much he loves us by laying down his life. And he did it so we could have eternal life that we could be adopted into your family and forever be royalty because of him. We pray this in his name.